Entrepreneurs, the playbook. I am giddy because this is a legend. He is another Hall of Famer to be on the playbook after 1,200 or so episodes of this extraordinary Napoleon Hill-esque opportunity. I have the legendary Hall of Fame tennis coach, Rick Macy. Welcome to the playbook. Oh, Dave, I'm glad to be here. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, well, I picked up on one thing in your background. I think most people, especially after the movie, are familiar with who you are. I always say the only thing I loved about Jerry Maguire is it made people familiar with who I was working with Lee Steinberg. But, you know, the interesting thing is you're from Ohio. And I'm always looking for people from Ohio because there's one characteristic about the collective consciousness of that extraordinary place to be from. And we have a work ethic. Uh, when you're born there, when you have grown up there, there's a work ethic that I still see when I visit uh, that is out of this world incredible. And I call it my superpower. And doing due diligence beyond what I already knew about you, I found out not only are you from Ohio, but you may be the first person that I've ever met that I can honestly say, this guy's more consistent than I am. And how is that an energetic, a genetic inheritance? Is it a learned trait? How did you become so darn consistent? First off, great question. I think a lot of people, you know, can pick up on a lot of this stuff. You know, you gotta, you gotta be structured, but I think a, a little bit of it could be genetic. I've always been, you know, the one to kind of get things going. Even when I was a little kid, I'd call people up at seven in the morning and organize the basketball games, the football games. Their parents would get mad because they're still asleep. I'm the first one there all the time. I always tell people, if you're first, you're going to end up being first in a lot of things. But I've always been like that. And uh, even today, you know, I still get up at 3.30. I open up the park. At 67, I'm a park ranger. That's on my resume. I'm still going strong. But no, it's just, uh, you know, I just, it, it's just been that way my whole life, you know. And I don't like change. Uh, which is sometimes bad. You know, I kind of got to mix it up a little bit. Uh, my full name is Richard Allen Macy. My kids call me Richard Alien Macy. They think <laughs> that I'm a little, you know, but I'm just boom, you know, and I got it down to the science and obviously on the court, you just keep growing and learning, but a little bit genetic, but it's a combination. You know, I like uh, from the Midwest, I like helping others more than helping myself and tennis just end up being my platform. And here I am still hanging in there and near the top of the mountain still. Yeah. And you've worked at all levels and the incredible thing about what you are, it's more than a coach. Um, you're a mentor. Uh, you were a great tennis player, not the best in the world, but a great tennis player. So you can give instructions on how to be great uh, as a mentor, um, as a teacher, uh, you're extraordinary, which is a hard combination to have a mentor and a teacher, someone that has the patience to explain exactly what they mean. You know, I was business partners with Warren Moon for almost two decades, and he would never be a coach because he said, Dave, I, I can't explain what I do. And although he's very good at what he does, which makes him a great mentor because he can give instructions for what he did, he doesn't know how to teach. But the most incredible thing, I think, looking at you as a mentor and a teacher is your coaching ability, meaning whatever level you meet someone at, you're able to bring the best out of them. What are some of the things that you've learned about being a coach to be able to bring the best out of individuals with all of their alien characteristics that are unique to their spirits of excellence? You know, well, probably, since the movie, I've probably done 75 podcasts. And the question you just asked me is one of the best ever, because you're right. You know, my favorite student of all time who's ever on, people think it should be like Venus or Serena or Capriati or Roddy or Sharapova. I'm telling you, Dave, it's who's on the other side of that net, that hour, that minute, that second. And they can feel that. And that's why I can extract greatness. It's just not the knowledge that I have. I know kind of how to say it, when to say it, why to say it, who to say it to. I talk different to a five-year-old girl than I do someone top 20 in the world. You know, it's a whole different thing the art of coaching, you know, and this is kind of what I do. And I just try to get better, you know, every day and then dealing with the parents. That's a whole nother animal. That's part of the whole smorgasbord that I got to deal with. So, um, but if you love what you do and you have passion, 
you know, and I can't wait to get on the court and, and help people. And I do the same, whether it's an 80 year old guy or a five year old little girl or the number one kid in the nation, you know, and people can feel that. And that's why I can get people to do things they never thought they could do because no human being on earth knows really what's inside another player or another kid. And a parent doesn't know what's inside their kid. And I push limits. You know, I really challenge their limits not limit their challenges. And it's just, I get people to do things, you know, and I, if I, if the doors close, I go through the window and if the windows close, I'll go down the chimney. I'm like a woodpecker. I'll just keep going in my way till I feel good about it and find the answer. And that persistence uh, has paid off big time. And that's why I've gotten people just to, I get them to believe even before they even thought about believing. I love it. And understanding those limitations of self. And I would say there's self-esteem and others' esteem. And one of the problems in especially children's tennis and children's sports is the problem of others' esteem. Uh, it's not only looking for the approval of others, looking for the motivation from others, uh, but especially when it comes to parents, you know, trying to live out our parents' dreams. And I know you're well known for saying that unless the kid wants it, it doesn't matter what you want or what the parent wants. They have to have that self-esteem. How do you determine, you know, where where that lies? Because I know you do often meet people that are there because their parents want them there. Um, Agassi is a great example of that, of, of someone that, you know, hit a very high level trying to have others esteem in mind and it cost him greatly in his mental health and in his life and his purpose. But how can you determine if someone has it, meaning they have the passion to be, or what I call the common denominator of success, what they must be? Yeah. Well, first off, another great question. You know, I think that's a job of a coach. You know, you can't have everybody's going to be the perfect student. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you got to motivate a lot. You got to create fun. And there's a way to get the job done. And so not everybody's going to have that fire in their belly. Not everybody's going to run for every ball, you know, like a Doberman pitcher's chasing them, you know. And if they're lazy, I got to get them unlazy. I got to get them to love the game. And I think uh, the passion that I put into people, I can flip the script probably better, better than anybody who's done this, you know. And I think that's part of the job of the coach. Not everybody's going to play on a pro tour and not everybody's going to get a full ride to college, but the, the life lessons they learn from Rick Macy or just the way I do these things is very different, but that's, that's what this is all about. You're not going to get the ultimate student and to back this truck up a little bit, and this is different, but Venus and Serena at the after party, when we were at the red carpet, they said, Rick, we were literally brainwashed to be number one. See, when they were 10 and 11, I never talked about Capriati or Graf or Hingis or Sellis or Sharapova, okay? I mean, I, I talked about them. I wasn't talking about 11 and 12 year olds. I said Capriati would get that, Sellis would get that. See, I'm looking at a different picture. I'm looking at something very, very different. And that's the way I coach. You know, it's always about the future, you know? So I get people just to, you know, believe in themselves. And like I tell everybody, I, I don't really change strokes, even though I'm pretty good at that. I change lives. And that means the most to me. If I can get someone to do their homework better, clean their room better, treat people better, get off drugs or whatever, because people that come back to me, Dave, that whatever profession they're in, the ripple effect or the cascade effect they've had from like me being me training them. Um, I, but I didn't try to do that. You know, it just kind of rubs off organically that they work harder and they always look at the positive and they find a way and all these things, uh, you know, so at the end of the day, that's the art of coaching. You know, you do your best you can for anybody, anytime, anywhere. And you subscribe to the same philosophy that I do that, um, you know, if you practice on your day off, you won't have an off day. But there's a weighted balance or a reality to that, especially in the physical realm, uh, yeah. being able to have recovery and access. Um, but yet I have a definition. There's a place called the empty mile and I call you an empty miler. Uh, the extra mile is very dangerous because what I have found and I do a lot of executive coaching that a lot of people will go the extra mile every once in a while and then they'll justify why they're not where they want to be 
by stating they went the extra mile a week ago or two days ago, there is an exponential, almost Einsteinian compound interest that occurs when you're able to go the extra mile every day. Now, you don't have to do it all day long, but I have activity I get paid for every day. I have activity I don't get paid for every day. And people say, oh, don't you want to take a day off, go off? No, I I don't, because I don't want to zero affect myself. How have you found the compound interest, the aggregate effect of consistent uh, focus, attention, and intention on the coincidences of what you want, the outcomes that you think you want? How does that zero day affect, whether it's two minutes or two hours, the overall outcome? You mean for a player or myself? Both. For a human being, right? It would, it would apply yeah. to everything. Yeah. No. Well, first off, with myself, you know, I just I just feel every day it's a game within a game within a game. And I got to get better, you know, and I'm trying to get better. I got better before I sat down and started talking to you, you know. And you know, when you look in the mirror, you know, you know the score if you're a real person. And, you know, I just try to keep getting better. And I've had that philosophy. And, you know, here we are now regarding people I coach, it's all depends on the individual. You know, it's a slippery slope. You can't treat everybody the the same. And so some people I got to know when I can push them more, you know, a perfect example. You got the, I want to tell a quick Serena story. This is like amazing. You know, we're in the middle of July. It's uh, 95 degrees. A lizard goes across the court. It can't even make it. It's so hot out. And so I'm there with Venus and Serena, and I go, Sir, I go, I call her Meek. I never called her Serena. Her name's Serena Jamika Williams. I go, Meek, you got to move your feet. Okay, Richard was gone. Okay, he was out somewhere. She goes, why? I said, you said you want to be number one. She goes, I will be number one. She gave me that look like you see at the U.S. Open. She had that look at age 11. Believe me, I like yeah. that look. And I go, well, what I got to do to get you to move your feet? She's already practiced day four hours, okay? and She goes, Rick, I'm really hungry. Can you have one of the coaches go to the snack machine, get me some hot curly fries, a Pepsi, a Snickers bar. And on the way to work, daddy drove by a stand and they were selling Green Day t-shirts and I'd like one of them. I go, whoa, 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 whoa. So you mean if I get the Snickers bar, the curly fries, the Pepsi, and I get you the Green Day t-shirt, you're going to start moving your feet? She goes, Rick, you see that tall skinny girl over there? She was pointing to VW because they played side by side. I'll make her look slower than molasses. So I go, Scott, one of the coaches, I go, Scott, go to the snack machine, get the curly fries, the Snickers bar, the Pepsi. On the way to work on Linton Boulevard, there's a stand. They're selling Green Day t-shirts and bring it back. So Scott gets all the goodies, brings it back under the canopy. Serena has her snack. She goes out on the court. She's hitting cross court and down the line, Dave, for one hour straight, popping the popcorn, extra butter, her hitting partners like 450 in the world from Congo, never misses a ball. All right. Sweat is pouring off this little girl like Niagara Falls. It's about 315. I'm on the other court now with BW. She goes, Hey, Rick, it's 315. I'm done. And you better have that Green Day t shirt here in the morning. <laughs> now, this is, this is 11. So, the moral of the story to everybody listening, I won as a coach. So I got an hour more of practice and she got better. Okay. So at the end of the day, that's the art of coaching. You know, she was in the tank. I flipped a script. So game, set, match, Serena Williams. I love it. Um, yeah. Mindset is obviously a big thing when it comes to sports and to life and being able to see the setbacks, failures, and mistakes to promote us and protect us is a lesson that as a sports agent, I tried to convey to the young athletes from my own personal experience and I do today for business. It's one of the superpowers of, of mindset. Obviously in tennis, uh, it's like being a defensive back. You better have a short memory uh, and you be able, better be able to learn the lessons quickly. How were you able to not only on the court, the physicality, but the mindset of your athletes at all different levels had a different type of skew. You know, We're in Newport Beach, so I'm used to the Nick, not the Rick. And he has a whole different methodology of handing off and delegating your hands on and you have a certain collective consciousness at your facility that everyone has a mindset of promotion and protection, not punishment. Yeah. No, well, first off, you know, you said it great, you know, having the ability to forget, 
not only in sports, especially tennis, because you know, you're by yourself. Uh, that's the leader in the clubhouse. And that's probably the leader in the clubhouse in life. If you can't forget, I tell people, you got to remember to forget. You know, I get them off balance with that one. So and you got 20 seconds to make it like it happened 20 years ago. And that's what I loved about Sharapova. She was in a bubble, even 11, even though athletically she was a little limited. Kennan was kind of like that too, because I had her from age five to 12. So the mental part, I teach all the time. And I was fortunate at a young age, I spent a lot of time in the early 80s with Dr. Jim Lair, who was a pioneer. And we spent three years together at Greenleaf. And, uh, but I was always intrigued. I did it on my own growing up in Ohio, never had a lesson. You know, I picked up a racket at 12, 18. I was number one in Ohio Valley with no lessons. So you got to understand, I did it through other ways. So at the end of the day, you know, the, the mental part is, is, is the key. I mean, that's what separates great from good. And great is rare air. Everybody's good. I mean, and this is what is, is tricky. That's why you see a lot of guys are much better in doubles because they got a therapist on the court. They miss a shot. And there's a guy there to hug him and kiss him and give a high five. In singles, you don't have that. You know what I mean? You got your own therapist out there in doubles. <laughs> so it's a very different dynamic. And I try to tell the people, you know, um, through positivity, the most positive athletes or even business people on this face of the earth are the most positive. Even though they could be ruthless or brutal or whatever, they're, so, they're just so positive. They look at the world through a different lens. And this is what I try to teach young people never to make excuses you know i just try to there's a medley of what i do it's not just biomechanics it's not just technical it's not just strategic the mental part is huge because i can have a bigger impact on them probably more than their parents you know because they're going to listen to me a little bit different and it's a different voice all right and when i can get into someone's head that i can get them to believe OK, if they can believe, then they definitely think they can achieve. Absolutely. Last thing, my definition I want to share with you of success, and I'd love for you to comment on my definition. And if you have uh, an additive or a supplement or a different one, I'd love to hear yours. But I believe that success is the ability to enjoy the consistent every day, persistent without quit pursuit of your own potential. And I think those people that can do that are successful. I'd love to hear maybe your comments on my definition and see if you have an alternative one or a complimentary one to it. No, you, what you just said, first off, I love it because at the end of the day, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. And that's what I try to tell everybody. At the end, do you get better today? And they might think they bet, got better because they hit balls and they sweat and they run. I go, no, you, you got worse. You know, I'll just be brutally honest with them. So the way you just frame that out, up, I love it. But regarding business, okay, if you're not getting ahead, you're getting behind. But people don't expect it from themselves. They don't keep score with themselves. And you got to keep score with yourself. See, I run a very different operation. You know, I talk to everybody personally. I answer every email, even though I have staff and everything. And when I answer the phone, they go, wait a minute, this is Rick Macy. Why'd you answer the phone? I said, it rang. That's why I answered <laughs> it, you know. And someone says, why, why do you pick the balls up when they're on the court? And I said, listen, I've been doing this for so long. I've never had the balls jump up and go back into the basket. You know, I still pick up garbage at the place. I just lead by example. Dave, I haven't sat down on the tennis court in 30 years. Never sat down. Okay. I just, and so the subliminal message that I give these kids, you know, that's what they come back with. And these life lessons, and that's why I love Richard Williams. People said, Rick, how'd you put up with this maniac for four <laughs> years? And people saw the movie, how stubborn he was and stuff. I said, listen, every night after practice, Venus and Serena would say, Rick, thank you very much. And they gave me a hug. They brought their books to the court every day. And if it rained, they went up in my office and studied. This is Orsine and Richard Williams' life lessons. So I saw how he was as a father. You know, the tennis part, I could just take a deep breath. When he wasn't there, I could go in and clean it up a little bit, you know. And, but it was about the girls. It wasn't about Rick Macy or Richard. That's the art of coaching, right? I, I wouldn't have lasted a week in that whole scenario. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, uh, take a deep breath before you react. 
count to 100. You got to have more patience on patience and patience. And people don't. People don't, you know, and I'm, I'm bulletproof. You know, nothing phases me, but I look at it as a challenge between me and me. And when you're doing that type of thing, you're going to be successful no matter what you do in life. Well, I know one thing what I've learned from you, uh, Rick, and would love to have you on my TV show as well, is that in order to win the game of life, uh, there's three sets uh, in Rick Macy's playbook. One is the mindset, two is the heart set, and three is the handset. And yep. you are a master of all three. And I just am so delighted to have learned the lessons from you. And thank you for bringing the best out of the best so that we all can enjoy at least a milestone or a trajectory of what we can be, because I know the common denominator of all successful people is that desire that we must be what we can be. And it's always nice to see a Serena Williams or a Warren Moon or a Tony Gwynn, somebody that we can say, wow, if they can do it, so can I. But you got to do all three, mindset, heart set, and hand set, the incredible Hall of Fame coach, unbelievable teacher and mentor, Rick Macy. Rick Macy.